Welcome to another episode of Divorce Wars. And first of all, listen, my heart goes out to you if you're currently approaching a divorce situation or there may be one in the future. Uh, having been there myself in 2001, I know how devastating it can be in all aspects of your life. So, again, my heart goes out to you if that's the case. And I appreciate you joining me. Even if there's a thought in your mind that this could be the direction your marriage is heading, Number one, you're not alone. 44% of all U.S. marriages, unfortunately, end in divorce. Listen, people grow in different ways, and they grow apart, and their priorities change. And sometimes the marriage just doesn't adapt to those situations. Um, I want to talk to you today about being prepared. And hopefully, if you know the thought of divorce is on the horizon for you and your family, potentially in the future. Hopefully this message is reaching you then and not when things have already begun to happen, not when your case is already in court. Because some of the things we'll talk about today are really preparatory to be in that position of strength um, for you and for your family. And if you have children, you know, the goal of this is to position you best for what's to come and to Start your new life successfully and allow your spouse to do so as well and allow your children to thrive. Um, so <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm thinking about my experience. And, you know, having never been through a divorce and hopefully never experiencing one again, I didn't know what to expect. And we have, you know, references in life. Unless we know somebody that's gone through the scenario that can coach us, you know, we all watch TV, and there are these fantastic, brilliant TV attorneys and scripted television that are, you know, at the last minute come up with these brilliant arguments and save the day, and they find a witness that no one thought of and bring them into court, and there's these gotcha moments and Perry Mason moments. And I want to first level set on the expectation that you shouldn't expect those things to occur in family court. It is actually a process, and a very methodical process. Um, secondly, before we start to talk about how to prepare yourself and potentially how to engage an attorney, let me say a couple things. Number one, this is not legal advice. It's not meant to be. I am not an attorney. There is no substitute for a legal expert in this equation. This is experiential, and this is awareness raising. And that's the hope of this session. And it's based on my experience as well as many people that have tried to help through this situation over the years. First and foremost, make it amicable. Do whatever it takes to be reasonable. Have a you know heart-to-heart -heart meaningful conversation, multiple heart-to-heart -heart meaningful conversations with your spouse that, hey, I'm seeing the potential uh, for our marriage situation to change. What's most important to me is that you're going to be okay, I'm going to be okay, and if we have children, most importantly, we can foster an environment together where we co-parent, uh, co where we start our life successfully and individually and support one another in this journey. Are there ways that we can explore together to make that happen? And you want to exhaust every possible means to resolve this amicably. Because let me tell you the horror story at the end of the day. You have a finite number of assets, whatever those are, $50,000, $100,000, a million, $10 million, whatever that number is can dwindle quickly in the family court system, in a contested divorce. It may feel like at first, like, I'm fighting this battle and I'm going to protect what's mine. And over time, you're going to come to realize if you do fight that battle, that when the emotions subside and the realities start to take over and you see the bills accruing, all of those precious assets that could be purposed towards starting your new life and helping your spouse start theirs, and most importantly, supporting your children through this, you know, emotionally challenging, potentially devastating time, helping them navigate and become good adults themselves that can go on and have a relationship of their own and learn from how the two of you navigated this experience together, having those assets in place make that 
much more achievable. Um, so if you can make it amicable, by all means do so. By every means do so. And exhaust every attempt. But I'll tell you what, I always advocate to folks that ask me for advice. Plan for the best and prepare for the worst. And so that's what I want to talk about to you in, in terms of the worst case scenarios. On the best side of the equation, know what you're prepared to give up. Know what you're prepared to fight for. Have an honest conversation about what it's going to take once you transition from one household to two and how to best use those assets to support. But you got to be prepared for the other side. <clears throat> so let me tell you, first of all, attorneys in family court, at least from all the experiences that I've shared with people and certainly from my own, they are not knights in shining armor that charge into court and save the day. They are legal experts, and it's important that you understand that they are experts in navigating the law and the legal system. You alone are the expert in your situation and circumstances. And the only way you can fully help them to help you, and I advocate to you in the beginning phase of divorces, especially through those initial temporary orders, especially if your spouse has an attorney, you should have one. And at very least, you should have an initial con uh, consultation with an attorney and find out from their perspective, how do you best prepare yourself? But let me tell you the things that I learned. If you begin to keep records and documentation, all of the interactions involving your spouse, especially if they're contentious, things involving your children, yes, school records. So... What the courts want to know is, as a family's dissolving, sure, there's going to be finger pointing back and forth, but what the court wants to see is actual evidence. And if you are concerned that the future may hold a divorce and you have children in the equation, you know, did you go to the parent teacher council meetings? And if so, pull some documentation from that. And hopefully, as a caring, involved parent, You've been at those meetings as much as you possibly can. You've showed up at your child's school events to support them. Not to create a basis for gaining custody afterwards, because the court can see right through that. Look, if work has kept you away, or maybe you've been a distant parent and now you want to change your ways, the best thing to do is to cop to that and make a change as soon as you can and get involved. But hopefully you've been involved and begin to gather that documentation to show that you've been an active, participating parent in your children's lives. And you can say all the things you want to, but the court leans extremely heavily into school records, medical records, doctor's appointments, um, sporting events. And yeah, as it relates to some of the more nefarious accusations that can occur, incident reports and police reports. So all of that information that you can collect, of course you're going to need to put together your financial records because there's going to come a point of accounting with the court. And very simply speaking, the court has guidelines for how they administer spousal support slash alimony and child support and how they divvy up the assets. Their goal in these guidelines is to create two equal and separate households. So they will t attempt to level the income such that both parents can provide an equal environment for their children. Now, if you've been the primary breadwinner and your spouse, male or female, has been the caregiver primarily, that can weigh against you in this financial equation. So you need to know that going in. You've earned 200,000 and they're at home attending to the children earning nothing. The court's going to level out your income so that the spouse's household upon separation can provide the same resources and the same environment that you can provide. So be prepared for that. And it is a spreadsheet formula. The amount of time each parent spends with the child affects the child support formula. And the court's going to, first of all, think of the best interest of the child and 
the current thinking is that it's in the best interest of the child for the child to spend significant and wherever possible equal time with both parents. So that equates to 50-50. Now the things that change that equation from a non-nefarious side are how actively and how involved you've been in the child's life. Were you a participative parent or were you traveling all the time or away all the time? Did you come home at night and tuck the children in and read them books? Because when the children are interviewed, those things are going to be, you know, the CPS, Child Protective Services, and the Family Court Services folks that may talk to your children. They're going to find that out very quickly. Um, so hopefully that's been the case. Hopefully you've been involved. If you haven't been, change that immediately. If you see something coming in the horizon, you need to be involved anyways. You're moving into a situation where you may be an independent parent, and it's time to bridge that gap if you haven't done so already. But assuming you have, they're going to look at school records again. How participative have you been? Have you shown up at the school events? Are you part of the child's education? Are you, you know, doing homework assignments with them? Do they talk about you in school? All that kind of stuff comes out in family court. And it can skew the um, percentage of custody assigned um, because the court's going to say, while both parents have been involved, one parent has been far more active, far more engaged in the children's time, and we don't want to disrupt that equation. So you got to think about that. But let's plan for the worst. <clears throat> in episode two, or I'm sorry, in part two, I told you a horror story where... The couple was heading for divorce. That was pretty evident to both of them. And unfortunately, one of them decided to concoct the story of abuse because abuse is a basis to change that best interest of the child equation. And if abuse can be proven, which it has to be proven in court, if it can be proven, then that's to say that one parent is unfit to have significant time with the children. Therefore, the other should you know, have the majority of that time. And in this parent's case, the whole goal was to get more time with the children, overprotective, over-assuming that they were the most important thing and the husband didn't matter, and wanted the money. So how do you protect yourself against that? You do so by gathering the receipts. And while you're trying to negotiate through this situation amicably, while you're sitting down to try to have conversations, you're going to get a sense very quickly whether or not amicability is achievable, right? And that's going to be how much that other person buys into the idea that, hey, why don't we help each other through this instead of fighting through this together, right? Um, if you, you know, talked about the, the gift of fear by Gavin De Becker, if your spidey sense begins to tingle and tells you, you know, there's, there's a hidden agenda here. You need to start protecting yourself right away because coming back to the idea of the attorney not being the knight in shining armor, they can only help you to the extent that you help them. They are expert in navigating the legal system. They are not expert in your circumstance and situation. And the more information you can provide them, will allow them to be helpful to you in interpreting your situation, your circumstances, into the legal system in a way that is going to be most beneficial in this whole experience. Hoping that that makes sense. So sit down with an attorney. If you suspect you know, divorce may be in the horizon, have an initial con uh, consultation. It's likely going to be free. And you want to find out their experience handling cases as you describe yours and look for a depth of experience. But you also want to ask them, listen, if I were to engage you, what kinds of things should I be pre preparing today in order to make that the most successful relationship should we start, you know, um, attorney-client relationships together? And they're likely to tell you a few things. First of all, gather your data, have a diary, Take note of the important milestones occurring, which we talked about. They're going to tell you to be honest and transparent. Because here's the thing. If you withhold information because you're embarrassed or, you know, it triggers something in you, 
it's likely going to come out in court at some point, either through your spouse, former spouse, uh, through the children, through independent witness statement, statements that may be introduced. So you might as well get it all on the table. Be prepared to get it all on the table. And if you do engage with an attorney, lay it all out on the line. That's the only way you're going to get good legal advice on how to navigate your circumstances if your attorney knows the actual circumstances, right? Get yourself organized, and this means financial documents, as I mentioned, school records, um, medical records, all those things as a parent, if you have children, that you've been involved in, start pulling all that data together, and oh, by the way, keep it somewhere safe. In the case of what I shared in part two, this was a egregious, horrendous spouse who leveled false accusations against her soon-to-be ex-husband. And let me tell you, she was in it to win it, and it didn't matter how much she had to lie. It didn't matter how extreme her, you know, tactics and actions were. It was all about getting the result that she wanted. Could she, would she have stolen the financial data or school records or hid them? Yeah, potentially she would have and could have. Be prepared. Keep it private. Keep it safe. Begin to have a diary and note all the things that are happening because they may become relevant as the case evolves through the court system. Keep that private. Keep it safe as well. And obviously, don't make it obvious that this is what you're doing, right? So get yourself organized. Um, sit down with yourself and really have a deep and meaningful conversation with yourself about what your goals and what your priorities are in this. Don't fight for time with the children if that's not really the thing that's important. If your spouse is better equipped to take care of them and you're better equipped financially to support your spouse and that's in the best interest of your children, be brave enough to say that to yourself and to make that agreement with yourself. And if the opposite is true, be brave enough and willing enough to state that these are the reasons why I think I should have significant custody, because it's in the best interest of my children, and here's why, and most importantly, here's how I believe we can prove this to the court. you got to get that in writing. What is most important to you? What will you fight for, and what are you willing to give up? I will tell you in my divorce, and I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about it. I'm not going to tell you the story that occurred. What I will say is that it went on three and a half years, and I will never forget Eventually, and I'll tell you why I did it, I took over as my own attorney, and I had some very specific reasons I'll share with you in some later uh, um, conversations that we have together. I was sitting down with the opposing counsel, and there was roughly about $25,000 left in our bank account. The house was forced into sale. The proceeds were split up. My retirement monies were already decided upon. Now we're down to just liquidity. And I'll never forget when the attorney's opposing counsel attorney said, well, you have about 25000 in liquid. My client proposes that you, you know, apportion 22000 and you keep 23000 whatever the numbers were. And I'm like, no way that that's fair. Uh, I'm not going to agree to that. Um, you know, I might consider 15000 uh, going to her, and he went, done, let's sign the papers. And that was the end of the negotiation. I said the words I might consider, which was a mistake on my part, and it really just came down to this. If they got to a number that was the priority number, the case was over. Three and a half years of fighting, and I can't tell you how many different uh, court hearings I attended where Attorneys for her would show up and then say, my client can't attend today because her back hurts or she's starting a business, we can't produce financial records. Delay after delay after delay just wrapped up the legal bills to the point where I took over my own counsel realizing that this was going to go on forever and it was going to cost me everything we had. Um, ended up with this. Once I said the number that they agreed to, the case was settled. So. Keep that in mind. Follow your attorney's legal advice, most especially in the early phases of this family court circumstance. From the initial hearing 
to the temporary order. And I'll get a little bit more specific on this in uh, part three. In most cases, the temporary orders become the standing orders. So everything you do from that initial legal filing, whether it's you or whether your spouse that files, to that initial hearing, to when those temporary orders are issued, everything you do in that initial phase could dictate everything that is to come. And it is entirely critical that you have good legal counsel, that you're able to navigate through this if your spouse has legal counsel. If they don't, and you're considering whether you should engage or not, just know that it may cause an equal and opposite reaction. Additionally, and keep this in mind as well, if there is a legitimate basis for the divorce that the court establishes your spouse has, you may be required to pay your spouse's legal fees. So really consider whether or not you want to engage an attorney first, right? Because if you do, and then your spouse engages, and they have real legitimate cause for, you know, being a part of this divorce, and they can prove it to the court, you may be on the hook and paying for both attorney's fees, both yours and your spouse's. Um, conversely, if your spouse has an attorney, and they have compelling reasons, you don't have an attorney, you may be on the hook for their um, attorney's fees as well. So there are a number of reasons why it's critical to have legal counsel. And by being transparent, by sharing with them, hey, this is our exact circumstance, that attorney is going to tell you, well, here are the best case, worst case scenarios. Here's what I need you to prepare for. Here's what I need you to think about. And here's the likelihood. And they're going to give you that advice based on representing countless numbers of people in these same situations. But again, and finally, I want to underscore this. The attorney is important because they understand how to navigate the legal system, but there are guidelines and baselines in place that are established, and they are the practices the courts will attempt to go by unless there's a compelling reason not to. So don't think that hiring an attorney unless you have just this ridiculously compelling case with proof behind you to demonstrate to the court how unfit your spouse is or how terrible the situation was, how financially irresponsible they were. And you can prove all that in court in such a way as to sway them away from this person who could be found to be irresponsible or, you know, egregious or, you know, whatever the case may be. Unless you have all of that, you are just going through a process, and your attorney's going to advise you how to navigate that process, but don't expect a knight in shining armor to come in um, short of that compelling kind of evidence behind your case. And realize that there are predictable outcomes you can go online today and look at and do calculations and understand what you're up against. You know, you can look online for best advice on how to get prepared, but don't walk into the moment having not done the groundwork and plan for the worst case scenario because the best way to be successful is to know what the worst case is and attempt to navigate as close to the best case as you can. Again, staying amicable. So I wanted to get all this out to you. It's been in my heart for a while to do these types of episodes. Again, this is not legal advice. I'm not an attorney. This is experiential and awareness raising hopefully in nature to you. I hope that you, this you know, gave you some thoughts to think about, whether it's for you or a loved one who may be facing this kind of a scenario into the future. Um, and I want to continue to share insights, information, and just good ideas on how to navigate this space successfully and how to start a new life empowered by what you've done and proud of what you've done instead of wiping out all your assets in a non-productive fight that just leaves you emotionally scarred, leaves your kids with nothing, and causes you to have to start all over again in your life. Uh, so that's the goal is to avoid that. So listen, if this was meaningful to you, or maybe someone you know you've shared it with, please click the like button. It helps the algorithms. It helps more people facing this kind of situation find this kind of content. 
If you haven't done so already and you got some value from today's call or some of the uh, scam um, sessions that I do, please be sure you're subscribed. And I hope you'll tune in to the next episode. And regardless of what's going on in your life, make today an excellent day. Do something you'll be proud of. Do something that's meaningful to you. And make a difference in at least one person's life if you can today. Thank you for joining me.